The Haystack Prayer Meeting that was held in Williamstown, Massachusetts, started in August of 1806, and it is viewed by most scholars to be the birth of American Protestant missions. Five Williams College students gathered in a field to discuss the spiritual welfare of the people in Asia. And within four years of that gathering, some of its members established the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. In 1812, that group sent its first missionaries to Asia. During the 19th century, it sent missionaries to China, Hawaii, and other nations in Southeast Asia, establishing hospitals and schools at its foreign missions. Many of its missionaries undertook translation of the Bible into the native languages. Until now, thousands of missionaries are sent not only to Asia, but they minister to numerous indigenous peoples. Today, we're gonna be looking at Acts chapter 13. We read Paul's conversion story last week, and in that story, God says Paul's going to be God's chosen instrument to bring the message to the Gentiles. So over the next three weeks, as we make our way to Christmas, we're gonna break out some maps and follow Paul on his three missionary journeys. And it's funny how we can look back and think, well, life was simpler in the past. You know, we call it simple times for a reason. We might think it was probably easier to be a missionary back then, easier then than it is today, easier in Paul's time than it is today. Now, right, there's so many more roadblocks and more people that might be offended. Today, it seems we're more hesitant to share our faith, more hesitant to tell somebody that you're a Christian. But times are really not that much different. The fact is that Paul, his world, was just as multicultural as ours. It was probably even more multi-faith, more superstitious than ours. And yet they had no hesitation in sharing the gospel with those who needed to hear it. So why is that? Well, first of all, they had a direct mandate from Jesus to do it, right? Jesus' last words are still ringing in their ears. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Plus, you almost couldn't help it. People naturally moved out from Jerusalem, and of course, they would talk to their neighbors. It wasn't... uh, uncommon that they would share their faith. They couldn't help themselves, could they? The Christians were excited and the rest of the world was curious. Verse one says, now there was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So what we see is, As the church grows, God steps in to make sure it grows even faster. God's Spirit comes to the Christians at Antioch and gives them an even greater mission. He tells them to send Paul and Barnabas for the specific ministry of bringing the gospel to a wider world. The church of Antioch was the first of five major churches in the early Christian era. Antioch was a major city in the Roman Empire and a key location in the early Christian community during Paul's time. Antioch is also the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and was one of the largest cities in the world in the mid first century. And now it's known as Antakya, Turkey. Paul had been brought to Antioch by Barnabas to teach the new Christians, particularly the Gentiles, about their newfound faith. And we could probably assume that the work of teaching people could have gone on for a very long time. And as you know, there's a lot of scripture to teach people. And presumably, Paul, he could have kept going on for years and years teaching the scripture to the church. And I think it's natural sometimes for churches to want to hang on to really good ministry. You know, they've been receiving uh, good instruction, but God had a much bigger, much wider vision because the world is a big place. God had chosen Paul to take the gospel into the Gentile world. We saw that back last week where we read about his conversion. And in fact, by the end of this chapter, 
That's exactly where he's going. But in the meantime, God needs to motivate them to get started. So God sends the church a message from the Holy Spirit. Now, before we move on to the next paragraph, we need to ask our question again. Does this help us or inspire us to do the same? To share the gospel with other faiths and other cultures? Should this continue? What, what do you think? What do you think God wants? Because I think the answer hinges on what God's desire is for those who still haven't heard about Jesus. And it depends on whether we think God still calls people to do this. Does he still send his Holy Spirit to convict men and women to take the gospel to other people? And more importantly, is he still speaking to the churches and even setting those missionaries apart? I think so. Don't you? Don't we believe the call to share the gospel is just as important now as it's ever been? When Jesus said, go out into the world, he meant just that. You know, we, we, when he talked about the ends of the earth, he's talking about every area of the world, where we live, where we play, we're going to find people who need the message of salvation. And if you think about that phrase, all the world, it's a much larger group of people today than it was in first century Israel. So yes, the call to share the gospel with people, it's as great as it ever was. And the basis on which we take that gospel to those people is the same as it ever was. We do it because God commands it. First, we have our direct command from Jesus himself. And second, we have the instructions given to us by the Holy Spirit. But having said that, we need to look at how this monumental task is done. Well, there are a few hints in this passage before us, so let's look at some of the ways Paul and Barnabas went out and spread the gospel in this great big world. So I wanna show you a map. Here is the entire world. Paul is starting in Syria, which is that orange block in the red circle. Here's your second map. Here's Syria a little closer. And as you can see, it's sitting next to Iraq below Turkey. And we can see Paul is on his way across the water to Cyprus. This map, this is our entire journey today. And Paul is going to make three very famous journeys, which we'll be looking at over the next few weeks until Christmas. Verse 4 says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So they sail from Seleucia to Cyprus, from the port of Antioch, which was founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals, and the year is 46 AD. Verse 5 says, when they arrived at Sal Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. How can we advance the kingdom of God? How can we be people who continue the missionary work today? Well, obviously, by proclaiming the word, right? <laughs> That's the first thing they do. Notice the first place they go. They go to people who are like them, right? They are Jews, so they go to the Jews. They go to Salimus, and that was an important port. It's a commercial center with a really large Jewish community. Paul is a professional craftsman. You know, we know from his writings that he made tents, he made awnings, which would have been... Uh, something he could have sold at the Roman marketplace. He may have set up a temporary market stall and discussed Christianity with people passing by and customers who brought their awnings and shelters to have them be repaired. It also says that they proclaim the word of God. Well, what's that? <laughs> it would have been the law, right? It would have been the Old Testament. Why, why would he even discuss the Old Testament? Well, because that's all they had. And the Old Testament's message is about the coming Messiah. Now, sure, if it were you or me, we might want to start with the four Gospels, right? But the point is, they begin with what God has already given them. They begin with the word that these Jews already know. And later, we'll see in a moment, they go on to the things that have recently happened in Jerusalem. But their first proclamation is the word of God. Verse 6 says, When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, named Bar-Jesus, 
He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elemas, that magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight path of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you'll be blind and unable to see the, the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So apparently, mission work is not just talking, right? It's not just using words. Paul demonstrates the truth of what he's saying by his actions, by the things he does. Paphos was the Roman capital of Cyprus, and it's a very important port as well. The island of Cyprus is traditionally regarded as the birthplace of Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love. She is also called Venus to the Romans. And in Paul's day, Paphos was famous for having this temple of Aphrodite. Paphos is also the home of the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus, and his court of attendants who collects taxes and maintains the bureaucracy of the Roman administration. And amongst those in the proconsul's court is this magician. His name is Bar Jesus, or son of Joseph. He's a magician who's been hanging around, no doubt, for monetary gain. So he has an invested interest in making sure these people are not converted. Well, Paul isn't going to let a magician stand in his way. And we have our second method for advancing the kingdom, by demonstrating God's power. First, Paul points out what he's doing. He says, you are making crooked the straight path of the Lord. And then he shows where the real power is. And the magician is struck blind. And the onlookers are amazed at God's power. Not magic, right? There's a difference. Not magic, but the power of God that's accomplished when you preach the gospel. Now, you or I will probably never come across an evil magician. <laughs> but in the course of our lives, we will certainly come across people who oppose the message of Jesus. And they'll do it for the same reasons as the magician in this story. Because the gospel threatens their livelihood. Or it threatens their comfortable lifestyle. Or their status. They'll use similar methods to oppose us. That is, trying to undermine the message of people who listen. I mentioned Night of Prayer, and I said, um, I said on the internet that at Night of Prayer we would have the Christmas shoe boxes to give to children in other parts of the world. And one person said, why should we help children in other countries when we have children right here in America who need our help? It's tough. You know, as a Christian, when you're trying to put positivity out into the world to do good and people immediately try to block you or tear you down or stand in your way. And when you hear those things, it's really easy to give in to those pressures. People will try to manipulate us to change our message or to tune it down. They'll try to make out that message to just be, well, that's your opinion. Or they'll try to make you feel guilty because you stood up for your beliefs. But that's the world trying to silence God, not you. Because this isn't your opinion. This is a message that God has sent to his people, to those who he's created. And he shows it's a message from him because he backs it up with his power. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go around striking people blind, but we can show others the way God works in our lives and the way God works in the lives of other believers. Because in today's culture, this mindset is, we don't all have to believe the Bible. There are other just as true religions. Besides, what does it matter that other people believe this or that? Don't we all have the right to believe what we want? Very similar message. 
but it's not true. Are you allowed to fly solo at your job? Just do your own thing, believe whatever you want? In the military, are you allowed to be an army of one? What if you told your superiors, I don't have to believe you, I don't have to follow you, I believe my own truth. Are we allowed to follow and obey only the laws we like in the United States? What if I don't believe in all of them? Don't I have a right to feel my own truth? Of course not. <laughs> Listen, there is a dark magician who is looking out for his own interests, who is whispering in the ear of the pro council, feeding the leadership lies that best serves them. And he says, you know, any worldview is valid as long as you believe it sincerely. Okay, I believe I'm a bird. I believe I can fly. Should we allow people to jump off buildings? Matthew 5 says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. My friends, you need to be the light of the world. A light that illuminates the emptiness of people's philosophies of life and to expose all the lies that they are told. As long as we also remember that in those times we're gonna be respectful. First Peter 3 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Be truthful, be gentle, be respectful. Verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogues and sat down. Paul and Barnabas set sail from Paphos to Perga on the coast of Pamphylia. It's on the southern coast of modern-day Turkey. And Mark, John Mark, uh, who was brought up in Jerusalem and was therefore not very familiar with foreign cultures, he goes home. Verse 15 says, After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them the judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So here we get this really detailed look into perhaps the sermon that Paul and Barnabas would preach when they tell the gospel. And this may be very similar to what they had said earlier in Cyprus. But here we kind of get an idea of how they go about it. And we notice that they're not just expounding on the Old Testament, they're actually retelling the story of God and how God has moved throughout history, but then also how God uses that history to bring about their salvation. That means we can also advance the kingdom by showing how God has worked in the past. Notice Paul begins with the story of Abraham, the formation of the nation of, of Israel in Egypt, and then he tells the Exodus, and then they move to the settling in the land of Canaan, and they talk about appointing King Saul, and then David, who is the greatest of Israel's kings, a man who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. And up until this point, none of this is new, right? The congregation would all be listening. They'd be nodding their heads, encouraging, thinking how great it was to have this very knowledgeable 
speaker from Jerusalem visiting their synagogue. And then Paul drops the bombshell. God has brought one of David's descendants to Israel, and he is the savior that was promised. He gives testimony about John the Baptist. Of course, they had all heard about John the Baptist. He says, brothers and sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and the rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilling them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was led with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man's forgiveness of sins is proclaimed by you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed from the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Paul goes from David all the way to Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And for these Jewish, Jewish believers, the good news is the things God promised in the Old Testament have now come true. And he finishes with, Jesus is alive. And then he gives them a warning. He says, don't fall into the trap that was foretold by the prophets, that you would hear the good news and reject it. And then what he does is he connects his audience with the larger story. He puts them into the story. And you do that by connecting the gospel with the people's lives, connecting with their people's story. Notice how Paul moves in that speech from the record of what God has done for them to their own story, to the events of their day. He bridges the gap between ancient history and current events. Of course, in their case, ancient events were not that far away as they are today, but this is still a principle that we can adopt as well. It's not enough to just talk about what God has done in the past or to say, it's because the Bible says so. If people don't hold the Bible as an authority, they don't care what the Bible says. They need to show, see how it's relevant to their life. How does what you're saying apply to them? How does it benefit them? For most people these days, anything that, that happened before they were born it is ancient history. So we may need to make a connection between what God has done in the past and what he's doing right now. The, the, what is the situation they find themselves in? Verse 42 says, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews, devout converts to Judaism, followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Finally, notice what happens. The Jewish leaders reject Paul's message. Basically, out of jealousy, he and Barnabas accept their rejection as a sign. And they say, you know what? That's fine. We'll just take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he says in verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, but since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. 
And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirring up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Notice that in the face of opposition, Paul and Barnabas still act with integrity. Right? The gospel message is for all people. God's desire was that the Jewish people would be the hands and feet that brought that message to the world. But if these Jewish people do not accept it, then Paul and Barnabas say they will do it themselves. So what we learn in this first story, this first mission of Paul and Barnabas, they go because God sends them, because God's desire is that people everywhere would hear the salvation story. Second Peter 3 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You know, I mentioned the shoeboxes earlier. The main reason we send the shoeboxes is not to give poor kids Christmas toys. They live in another country. They don't even know what Christmas is. We want to spread the gospel. We want to show them Jesus. Those boxes also carry a message of love and grace. And that might be the very first time they hear about Jesus. And as they go, they connect the people's story with God's story so that everyone who needs to hear the message, they get a chance to hear it. If we're really asking why we share the gospel with people overseas or why we would share the gospel with a Muslim or a communist or a socialist, then we have forgotten the oldest Sunday school lesson, surprisingly taught to us by a good magician. This is Clarence Herbert Woolston. Woolston was pastor of the East Baptist Church in Philadelphia and how lucky they were to have him. Woolston was also a part-time magician and would use his sleight of hand and his love for animals to speak to kids. He would bring a baby bear cub into a church to illustrate the sin of stubbornness. Woolston was also known to bring a baby leopard to kids' assemblies. There's a photo of, of, uh, of him in one of his books the church is filled to the rafters, literally with children, craning their necks to see him. And Wilson also wrote two books, Object Lessons for Kids. One entry in his book says that we should be like a postage stamp. He says the postage stamp is non-combative. When it is licked, it does not hit back. It is a peace lover. The postage stamp does what it is told to do. It does not seek to know the contents of the letter, but to deliver the letter to the party named. His second book is called Seeking Truth, a book of object lessons with magical and mechanical effects. It is a 207 page book of real miracles that you can perform to entertain children while you teach them the Bible. Harry Houdini said that that book was one of his prized possessions. But you know, Wollstone is not famous for any of that. In fact, he's not famous at all. The only reason that you would know him is that he wrote a song that you were all taught in Sunday school. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Why is missionary work so important? Because God sends us and we are still called to preach, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That means here in Montgomery, as well as California and New York, but it doesn't matter. It goes to Nambia or Chile. Our God does not look down and see the earth and see countries and cities. He sees children. He sees his children. And the missionary work is just as important now as it ever was. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for people all over the world 
who have yet to hear the good news. There are still ears that have not heard the peace that only you can bring. There are mouths that are hungry, that need to be fed with food, stomachs that need to be filled, and they need to know that the person who brought that food brought it with the love of Christ. Lord, we pray for missionaries all over the world, that you would strengthen them and give them the support that they need. We pray for those who work tirelessly year after year, and we pray for those who are just beginning their mission work. Lord, it's not about taking the gospel to the ends of America. It's about taking the gospel to the ends of the world so that one day every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Thank you so much for missionaries and for their work. Amen. Hey, we'd invite you to stop by and visit Walden Community Church. We are here in Montgomery. We have two services every Sunday, one at 930, which is a traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We're going to do responsive readings. It's everything that you remember about church growing up. And then our second service is at 11. It's a more contemporary service. We have a worship team. Come casual and bring your family. We have a program from children all the way through high school, and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.